Alex here with part six of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. I'd like to take this opportunity to point out part zero of the series as that is the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the detailed explanation as to what the purpose of this series is. Very quickly, I will just state that uh, please don't feel bad for me. Everything that is going to be covered in this series has already happened and is no longer a concern as my case is completely and totally closed. I also wanted to mention that it can't be reopened. My ex's parental rights have been terminated, so I'm not doing videos like this to sort of get people to join my cause or feel bad for me or anything like that. I also wanted to mention that I am creating this series as a very detailed, comprehensive, gigantic example as to what I personally went through in my eight years of representing myself in the uh, family court system. So going forward, there was a whole lot of storytelling in parts one through five, and I described my mindset in as much detail as I could with as much as I could remember. There were several parts during those videos where I had gone through papers and pleadings and was quite shocked because I just couldn't remember. From uh, 2008 to today, we're looking at 11 years, and, or almost 11 years, and it's quite astonishing to me the things that I did know back then that I thought I didn't know and it's quite astonishing to me some of the allegations that I couldn't even remember so with part six there isn't a whole lot to cover with regards to my mindset and what I was thinking because there was only a couple of days from what I discussed in part five which was my filing of the ex parte the two ex parte motions uh, the ones that I discussed in the previous video that were filed as largely an, emo an emotional reaction as uh, me having freaked out at the sudden flurry of allegations and accusations that my ex was uh, sending my way that I, based on what I had put together in the petition in part one, had no idea as uh, I didn't even want to discuss any of the issues that she was having. When you look back at part one, you'll see that my petition doesn't contain any allegations or accusations against my ex with regards to her mental health, issue, uh, mental health issues or her attempted suicide. So parts uh, two, three are largely her counterattack, which is responding to my petition to establish custody and visitation with her peti uh, petition for order of protection against domestic violence. And parts uh, four and five were largely my reaction, which is quite frankly an emotional reaction based on the shock and the, quite frankly, panic state that I was in, having basically been accused of being a violent person, which involved filing three different ex parte motions, one to dissolve the order of protection, one to order, have her order to remain in the state, and one to have her psychiatric and mental health documents turned over. So there isn't a whole lot to say with regards to my mindset in part six, because after all of that crazy stuff happened, it's like a day or two later when she finally files her answer. So this is the first time that I knew that she had an attorney because this is the first time that anything had been filed in either of the two cases by an attorney. So let's take a look at what her attorney has filed. As you can see, this is the answer and counterclaim. This is the responsive pleading. It is a pleading under the definition of Nevada law. If you want to know why that may or may not matter, please watch my video on pleadings. This was filed in response to my petition, which is the initial pleading in the case. And it basically will go down the list of allegations that I made in my petition and either admit them, deny them, or deny them for lack of understanding or for lack of knowledge, however you want to look at it. The pleading was filed by my ex's attorney, Catherine Burning. This is an attorney who remains with her for 
most of the case. I would guess around five years off the top of my head, maybe six. And over, over the years, I did eventually establish a professional relationship with Catherine Burning, or at least you could say respectful, actually, you probably couldn't say professional since we didn't work together, but we did over time come to respect each other. Early on in the case, she did some things that I found to be very unscrupulous, and I will address them as they arise in the series, but towards the end of the case, I eventually reached this point where it was easier for me to deal with her attorney than it was for me to deal with her. So. Let's take a look here and scroll down. Well, hold on a second. In the upper left, you'll see that the attorney has put her information here. My understanding is that ordinarily, when an attorney jumps into a case, they have to file a notice of appearance to let everybody know that they are going to be representing a litigant in that case. But apparently, upon filing the initial pleading or any of the responsive pleadings, if a attorney puts down that they're the ones to have prepared that pleading, they are presumed to be making an appearance in that case. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, especially if there's an attorney out there to say otherwise, but that's my understanding as to one of the ways in which an attorney can make an appearance on a case. This could get complicated in situations where somebody hires unbundled attorneys, and as far as I know, Catherine Burning does later on file notice of appearances in the case anyway, and I'm not sure why she does that, but I did want to mention that Ordinarily, an attorney won't just um, file a paper and put their information in the top left and expect you to understand that they have made an appearance. Ordinarily, from what I have seen, the attorney will file a piece of paper called the Notice of Appearance. But as I mentioned a second ago, this is the, uh, the, the pleading that my ex is filing in the case. It's a response to my initial pleading. It's a response to my petition. And so this this alone here, this signature and this uh, specification as to the attorney's name and bar number is sufficient to make her appearance in this case. So I'm going to scroll down and one of the things that people might find remarkable about an answer is that it is extremely basic. All it does is admit or deny the allegations that I have made in my initial pleading, in my petition. I'm going to be marking the page and line numbers according to where I'm at on this specific answer and counterclaim, but I will jump back to my petition when it refers to paragraphs in my petition. And I'm just hoping that my viewers understand that the page and line numbers are reflecting the location that we are on in the answer and counterclaim and not in my petition. You will be able to refer to my petition according to the paragraphs that the answer uses to refer to it. So straight away she is admitting paragraphs 1, 2, 3, and 4. So let's take a quick look at what she's admitting to. Here is my petition. We're going to scroll down. Um, and you can tell what a paragraph is based on this little Roman numeral sim uh, symbol here. Typically you want to make them as uh, brief and terse as you possibly can just in case you put together an allegation that is multi-part and you don't want to give your opponent the opportunity to deny the allegation even though portions of it may be true. It is better to list um, allegations that are more terse, break them apart so that way um, you can have your opponent nail down on certain allegations. They will be forced to admit certain allegations because you didn't blob them all together, thus giving the opportunity for them to deny it and then say later on, well, we denied it because that little piece of it wasn't true. This is a self-help form, so I don't have the um, ability to really control that. As I mentioned in my previous videos, I'm not fond of self-help forms, but I'm not going to go back into that monologue. You can watch the previous videos to... Um, ascertain as to why I'm not fond of them. I go into a pretty detailed explanation, but at this point in time, I didn't know. I mean, this is my first uh, paper filed in my ch uh, child custody action period, so I had no clue that there was any other way to do this. Anyway, allegation number one is basically where I live, where I, um, how long I've lived there, and there's nothing more to it than that, and she's admitting that. She's admitting allegation number two, which is where our son resides. And according to the pleading, I'm admitting that he resides with her, so she has no, no reason to deny that, um, along with all the other details with regards to time. Paragraph number three here, it's detailing, I'm detailing that the other parent is her, that I don't know where she lives, 
and you know details as to where she lived prior and how long she lived there. She admits that. And allegation number four is Ooh, the paternity acknowledgement. So she could have tried to deny this, and that would have forced a verification of paternity. Or, well, maybe she could not have denied it because of the birth certificate. I was on the birth certificate, so she may have had no choice. But, um, yes, she admits paternity, and so that never became an issue in her case. And as you can imagine, these initial pleadings give the court a snapshot as to where each of the parties stands at, on, at the onset of the case. And so they're very useful to a court and to the parties because now the court and the parties, me and my ex, are on notice that we do not have to go and deal with paternity. It's admitted, it's not, in, you know, it's not being contested. So that's just one less thing to have to worry about at an evidentiary hearing or a trial later on. The next response, the next answer is paragraph 5, which she denies receiving child support. You don't actually have to put details like this when you respond. She could have just said denied, but she went above and beyond and explained what portion of it she denied. And that may be because it's a self-help form and the judge might have gotten annoyed. Uh, typically, with custom forms, you're expected to know what you're doing and uh, these allegations would have been broken apart so that she would have been able to deny it without having to explain anything because it would have been clear what she was denying. But if we take a look at paragraph 5 on the self-help form, let's see what it looks like. Yeah, it's, it contains a slew of allegations. And so, had she denied paragraph 5 without an explanation, the court and I myself would have been like, okay, what specifically do you have a problem with? But anyway, she specifically denies receiving this $200 per month. This, I don't recall this being a dispute later on. I really don't. So I'm not sure why it was denied in the in the answer and then just abandoned later on. But she did, she did the same thing with the uh, allegations of domestic violence. She fought tooth and nail in the order of protection action. But once that case was over, she just totally abandoned it. So... I'm not surprised that I can't remember that she tried to say she wasn't getting that 200 bucks a month. Let's take a look at line, uh, paragraph 6. She responds by admitting each and every allegation in paragraph 6, which is... This is the paragraph... Well, I don't actually describe anything here. She's admitting that there were no, previous, uh, no prior custody orders, which is true. Uh, answering paragraph 7, so she admits portions of it again and denies each of the remaining allegations. Paragraph 7, she admits to being the primary caretaker. See, these aren't really allegations. These are just, these are just what I'm demanding. So she's basically just saying that she disagrees with what I think I'm entitled to. So paragraph 8, she admits to having contact described but denies everything else. Let's see what we're describing here. Paragraph 8, telephone contact and physical contact for approximately two hours per week. So she's admitting that apparently she's trying to deny the fact that my son and I spend time together recreationally. It's difficult to tell. It, it's um, kind of a moot point, too. I don't recall that being a point of contention throughout our child custody case. I, don't, I recall other things, like allegations that I don't feed him or don't clothe him, but I don't recall that being a concern. The counterclaim. Now, this is what you're, you're typically supposed to do. Once one person institutes child custody proceedings and they make their demand as to what kind of custodial rights and visitation they want, the responding parent will file a counterclaim and they will make a request for a different custodial order and a different uh, visitation order. So she's filing a counterclaim and she is making the first allegation which is that she resides in Nevada. This is used to establish jurisdiction in this state 
She's specifically alleging how long she has been present in the state and that also that she doesn't intend to leave. Allegation number two is that we were never married, which is what you kind of need to do for a child custody and visitation action. If we were married, we would instead file a complaint for divorce with children, and they would deal with child custody within the context of the divorce. Allegation three is that we have a minor child and his birth date. Allegation four is that she is fit to have sole physical and sole legal custody. <laughs> and she's saying that I have mental health issues. Talk about projection, considering what occurred in, or uh, considering what I detailed in parts three and four of the series. What this ends up being, okay, I want to clarify this. This mental health concern she has later on evolves into anger. She says that I'm an angry person and that I need anger management. And the there are psychologists out there who have explained how this whole uh, calling the other parent an angry person in a child custody divorce action doesn't actually attribute to the person's personality, but rather to how the person is being treated. And they call it a fundamental attribution error. You can't um, disrespect another human being, deprive them of time with their child, and then when they get angry in response to those things, point the finger at them and say, oh my God, you're an angry person, you have mental health issues and you're, you need anger management. You can't do that because you're attributing, you're attributing the anger to something internal, a part of their core personality that needs to be addressed, when in actuality, the anger is just connected to you know, the circumstances that they're facing at that time. This is tantamount to punching a person in the face on the street, and then when they get angry and scream at you or want to fight you, then you point the finger at them and say, oh my god, you're an angry person, you need anger management. It's like, no, they're not an angry person, you just punched them in the face. So they're angry because of what you did to them. Um, anyway, this does end up coming, uh, this ends up being alleged later on in the case quite quite thoroughly and quite repeatedly as me being an angry person. But we'll go into detail uh, when that comes up later on in the series. Allegation number five. Mother would request supervised visitation is appropriate until I address my mental health issues. Allegation number six, child support for the law, pretty standard. Allegation, and she ends up paying child support, most of the case. For a very short period of time during the beginning of the case, I pay, and then she ends up paying it for around six to seven years until her parental rights are terminated. Um, not because she wants to pay it, she's forced to. Allegation number seven, contribute okay so she's asking to contribute to health insurance but of course she wants me to pay half the cost of the premiums this is pretty standard that's required under the law paragraph 8 she has been required to get a lawyer and that I should be required to pay for her attorney I have a video where I just bash this whole idea of taking a person who is too poor to afford their own attorney and forcing them to pay for the attorney of the wealthier person. This idea is so anathema to what's morally right and fair that I would go into probably an hour-long discussion on it if I got out of hand with this specific video. But I was fending off requests for attorney's fees at least six times, I think probably closer to seven or eight times. And it is just really frustrating because when you are so poor, you are barely making ends meet at home, and you can't even afford to pay some of these filing fees, much less pay for your own attorney, and then to have the other person who can afford an attorney turn around and say, hey, it's great that you're too poor to pay for your own, you can also pay for mine. It's just, it adds insult to injury in the most despicable, disgusting way imaginable, and yeah, there's two or three different videos where I go into this uh, this topic, and I'm going to avoid doing it now, but this is something that will come up in the case over and over again, and it's meant to just kick a person when they're down, in my honest opinion. It's a, a person's already struggling to learn how to represent themselves, and the person who is wealthier just, you know, just beats on him while they're down, and it's like, make you know, pay for my lawyer. You can't pay for your own, but I'm going to make you pay for mine. Anyway, we'll talk more about this when it comes up throughout the series, and we'll keep track of how many times 
her attorney asked for me to pay her attorney's fees. But it is one of the areas where um, I would actually become rather furious. I wouldn't like yell or anything like that, but I did a tremendous amount of research on learning how to defend against attorney's fees just because it comes up so often. And in fact, one of the things that I warn my viewers about is if you're representing yourself, or even if you're not, just expect the other side to just constantly ask for attorney's fees and learn everything you can about how that works. Every little teeny tiny nook and cranny as to how attorney fee awards works because that is an issue that comes up. And you won't be wasting your time doing research on that because it will come up and you will end up using your knowledge. And uh, let's move on here actually. So here she's making a request for sole physical custody and sole legal custody. I made a request for uh, joint physical and joint legal, but um, she felt she was entitled to everything and that I was entitled to nothing. That's how the case started out. You know, I tried to be as fair as I possibly could. I made the request for uh, joint physical and joint legal custody, even though in hindsight, looking back, that wasn't really what was in the best interest of our son. And later on, I was able to correct it. But um, straight from the beginning of the case, uh, she wanted to have both physical and legal custody and I guess just leave me with supervised visits. The um, request for costs and attorney's fees is reiterated and uh, this uh, line three here, the court that the court enter further relief as it deems necessary, is a um, canned request. It's, a, it's like a boilerplate thing that all attorneys will put at the bottom of their pleadings. Oh. I didn't know this. Apparently Muriel Skelly signed this for Catherine Burning. I never once saw Muriel Skelly appear in the entire six years that Catherine Burning was on the case. Never once. And this is the first time I'm seeing the signature here. She's, I'm not going to say she's a huge deal, but she's kind of a big deal. She's done a lot of uh, trainings for, she, she's done a, what do they call them? It's where you go and you, I think they call them like, like bar luncheons or something like that, where they will like reserve a room somewhere for a lunch and all these attorneys will show up and then like one attorney will get up in front and like teach the other attorneys about, you know, little quirks about specific areas of the law and stuff. I know that Muriel Skelly is kind of a big deal in that sense because I've seen that she's got some videos out there online that people use for educational purposes, mainly attorneys. But I never once saw her actually represent my ex. It was always Catherine Burning. Uh, this is the verification. I've talked about these before um, on multiple occasions when there are factual allegations made in a pleading, which is pretty much always. It has to be verified. In fact, there's probably actually a court rule that mandates a verification in all pleadings, period, no matter what. With regards to motions, there are certain situations where it might not be required. And in that case, they don't even call it a verification in, the, in you know, the motion anyway. It's just considered an affidavit that supports the motion, which is required under another area of the law. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the local rules, I've seen where the, these uh, little tiny details and quirks come up. A lot of this stuff, I think, to people, including to me, seems like just something that you just have to do because it's in the form. But the form didn't create the law, that would be like the tail wagging the dog, it's backwards. The law was created and then somebody drafted the form afterwards to be consistent with the law or the court rules. So a lot of the things in here you can track down in the court rules or statutes and find find out for yourself, oh that's why they have that there, oh that's why they have this there. And when it comes to drafting custom papers and pleadings, that's how you figure out what you're supposed to put in your papers or pleadings. So by doing the research notarized. I've mentioned before that this is something that we just don't do anymore in Nevada. Most of the time people just get a declaration in lieu of affidavit and so by doing that you don't need a notary stamp, notary signature. You can save the time and the money. This is one of those boilerplate uh, affirmation sheets that I've discussed before. It's used to let people know that, or let the clerks know specifically, that this document doesn't contain the social security number of any person. It's one of those privacy issues that popped up some time ago. And it, it's, uh, this requirement comes from a statute. It's from NRS, oh here it is, NRS 239B.030. And I've mentioned in prior videos that I'm not even sure if this thing is still in place. I think it is, but I haven't double checked that. Really quickly before I close this, I can see here where Catherine Burning signed it. 
Before I close this, I was going to take a really quick look at the top to see if it mentions Muriel Scully. Yeah, it really doesn't. So, okay. That's just something that I just learned today. I did not know that she worked in the same firm. I knew about Fry. Robert Fry was her partner for a long, long time, and he got into some trouble with the law. Um, not connected to our case at all. So, having reviewed the answer and counterclaim, I can say with certainty that I was upset, betrayed, shocked. It's just so hard to describe with one single emotion. It's just this giant jumble of emotions that you can't even make any sense of. I know that I reacted to receiving this the same way in which I reacted to receiving all of the other papers that she'd filed, and that was to immediately, within a day or two, go back to court and file something else. With my previous um, receipt of the order of protection, I responded by filing three different motions within two days. And with the receipt of this answer and counterclaim, I literally the next day, as in tomorrow from having received it, went and filed my reply to it. And that's just something that I think a lot of my viewers will understand. Even if they didn't necessarily go out and file responses within you know a day. A lot of my viewers do have attorneys and they don't work on that same schedule, but I'm sure many of my viewers who are representing themselves have done something like that before because you're so panicked, angry, you're freaking out, and you just can't do anything else until you respond. And it's like, it's almost like an obsession because it's, you've been accused of these horrible, horrible things you're probably not used to being accused of things that aren't true. For sure, people aren't accused of doing that in court. I mean, not many of us end up in court all the time. For a lot of us, the child custody case probably is the first time we've ever been in court. And so it just magnifies all of that. It makes it so much worse because a person isn't doing it to just make you feel bad. A person is doing it to deprive you of your rights. And for many of us, to the detriment of your children. So it's just, it's indescribable almost. You almost have to have just felt it yourself. There's no list of words that I can put together to get somebody to understand what it feels like. It wasn't even so much, at least not for me, it wasn't so much the request for sole legal and sole physical custody. I had already kind of got the gist of the approach she was going to take. By the time I looked at the orders of protect, the order of protection, the other filings, um, that were alleging that I was a violent and dangerous person. But what really surprised me with this specific pleading was that she alleged that I had mental health issues. That was the allegation that got under my skin like you couldn't imagine. Because the reason I left the relationship was because the mental health issues that she had were out of control. And living with her was walking on eggshells every second that we were in the same place. And... It was really highlighted by the fact that she attempted suicide and was detained at a mental health institute for 72 hours. And it really just, there is something about a person accusing you of something that you are nowhere near and they are 100% in that precise category as to what they're accusing you of. There's something about doing that that just is... It's more maddening than any other kind of deception or false accusation because it's just, it's just, it, it, it like I described, it, it gets under your skin in a way that no other lie will. To, to, for your ex or your opponent to fit right into a label and then point the finger at you and say that's what you are, it's just its own class of lie. It just fits, its, it fits it into its own separate dimension of lie. It's that bad. And that is what really got to me. And I still remember that to this day. And that is something that persists for a while. Later on, her attorney softens it to me having anger management issues, as I mentioned earlier. And that kind of eventually goes away, especially after I end up being awarded joint physical custody. But for I think, you know, this, this pleading is the one that really gave me the full picture as to what to expect. And it wasn't something that she let up on, at least not voluntarily. 
Throughout the case, she does eventually back away from certain allegations and certain accusations, but it's not because she wants to. It's because the court just doesn't believe her, and she realizes it's an exercise in futility. The one exception is the whole insistence to not uh, disclose where she resides. That is the one thing that she just won't let go of from beginning to all the way to when her uh, parental rights were terminated. And in fact, that was one of the reasons as to why her parental rights were terminated, because she just would not let that go. So going into the aftermath, to file an answer, it cost her $94. And I know for sure that the price has gone up since then. It's probably in the high 100s. Not something that I'm going to double check on because there's no point to it really. Even if I got it right, it would just change again in three or four years. These prices go up consistent with inflation. That's at least what I imagine that they would tell us. And when it comes to her attorney's fees, because she now does have an attorney, I'm going to give it my best guess and assume that her attorney charged $250 an hour. It's pretty standard with regards to attorneys. Some charge $300, $350, some charge $200, but I'm pretty sure that that's what she was being charged just because it's the most common amount, at least that's my understanding. And I'm going to guess that her attorney billed her two hours for this pleading, and it probably included like her consult, a few phone calls, a few emails back and forth about what she was going to put in it and probably a little bit of money for the paralegal as well as to arrange for it to be served on me. It should have been served by mail. I don't think I was served personally with the answer and counterclaim. That would make no sense. You don't have to serve it personally. So it was probably served by mail. Anyway, I'm going to do my best, my best guess going forward when I try to come up with the attorney fees that are put into a case, and at least when it's my, my ex's attorney's fees. When it's my own, I'll give the exact dollar amount. There were very few times when I had to pay attorney's fees, but um, when it comes to her, I'm going to do my best to guess. I'm not going to try to inflate them or, or exaggerate them or anything like that. I think that for this specific pleading, she was probably billed around $500. That's $250. Um, two hours, so 250 times two, 500. And I don't really have much else to say at this point. There's going to be a whole lot more when we actually start getting to some of these hearings, at least hearings that I'm actually allowed to be present at. And I'm sure that my viewers are going to want to take a look and see specific snippets from those videos. And I will, of course, also make those videos downloadable to the viewers as well. So that being said, post anything in the comments below if you have any questions, and I will see you guys next time.